My name is Dave Rex. I'm a specialist dietitian uh, here at The Pines and um, I mostly have a caseload of children either on the autistic spectrum or with an ADHD diagnosis. So I'm going to be taking you through some um, information today about how to understand, how to assess and how to influence um, children's food choices. I'll be doing it in in five sections. So by all means, um, if you have enough time, you can listen to all of the sections in one go, um, or, or you might just wanna spend a few minutes to do, um, to do one at a time. So the sections we'll be covering include, um, number one will be uh, how you know if uh, a child's diet is, is good enough, not necessarily the perfect diet, but a diet that you don't need to worry too much about. Um, how the diet affects the body and uh, specifically the brain. Um, we'll be reflecting on the many reasons why we and why children and young people eat the way they do and um, thinking about how we can help children learn about nutrition. And last but not least, we'll be thinking about how we might influence the eating habits of a very selective eater, such as some of the children that are refer to me for dietary assessment and advice. Okay, so the first section is um, how you know whether a child's diet is, is good enough. Um, most of you watching this will recognize this picture of the Eat Well plate with the five different food groups on. And we can see the largest two groups at the top, the starchy carbohydrates and the fruit and vegetables should represent most of what somebody eats. That's why they're shown as the larger groups. The smaller groups at the bottom um, include uh, calcium rich dairy foods like milk, cheese and yogurt, and the non-dairy protein foods like meat, fish, eggs, nuts and pulses. And there's also a small uh, group there coded in purple, which are the foods that are kind of high in fat or sugar, but don't have anything nutritionally important uh, included within them. Okay, so if that's the, the overall balance, the overall balance that we see in terms of dietary guidelines for, for children and, and for adults, um, it's important to kind of see how children's diets um, that we're concerned about measure up against that. This has actually been changed more recently. So um, a couple of years ago, um, the government moved towards the Eat Well Guide. So we've lost the knife and fork. It's not the Eat Well Plate anymore. And you can see um, the pictures similar but different, really. So the purple foods that were at the bottom of the plate model are now mostly shown out to the side in the bottom left uh, with a message there saying eat less often and in small amounts. The only purple coded food group left within the Eat Well Guide um, are, the, are the oils and spreads. But other than that, the other groups are fairly similar. The main four food groups are still included there on the Eat Well Guide. They've added some information in the top right about hydration um, and in the bottom right hand side, they've given some calorie information as well. So if we look at each of those four main food groups, then we've got the starchy carbohydrates and we've got the fruit and vegetables. We've got the sources of non dairy protein like meat, fish, eggs, nuts and pulses. And finally, the calcium rich dairy foods. Sometimes it's quite useful to kind of symbolize these. Um, starchy carbohydrates largely for energy, um, fruit and veg to keep our heart healthy, as well as lots of other things, um, protein to help us grow, and for strong bones and teeth, calcium rich dairy foods. So if we think about these four main food groups, we need to eat these quite regularly. They give us something that we need. Um, so the terminology we like to use locally is to think of these foods as everyday foods. So putting all that together, um, when I'm assessing a child's diet and I'm going through um, what they most typically eat with a, with a parent or, or their carer, um, most typically we find that there's something in the starchy carbohydrate group that they like. Most, but not all, will enjoy either milk, cheese, or yogurt, or all three. Um, but again, not all of them. And the foods, of course, that we're supposed to eat less often than in small amounts are often quite strongly favoured. The two food groups that are more challenging tend to be the non-dairy protein foods and the fruit and vegetables. 
That's probably for three reasons. Some is the complexity of texture. Some is the intensity or complexity of flavor. And sometimes it's just that the foods that exist within these groups have the most kind of natural variation. It's not that every single one looks or tastes exactly the same. So all of these can represent challenges for children who, who are quite selective in their eating habits. And, and yet these are the two groups that, that provide, two of the groups that provide really important nutrition. Um, thinking about the language we use to talk about food, I'll say more about this later, but those foods that used to be in the purple group that are now on the bottom left, the foods that say eat less often and in small amounts, it's quite useful to think of those as sometimes foods. And in one of the following sections, we'll talk more about why we use that terminology. And that's as opposed to the everyday foods that we need. Um, and although there is calorie information in the bottom right of the Eat Well Guide, particularly for children, but arguably for adults too, it might be better to move away from thinking about calories and calorie counting towards actually trusting what our body's telling us. So the message we prefer is eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. When we're doing a dietary assessment then, we might ask some key questions to decide um, whether a diet's really something to worry about. And obviously the ideal would be that a diet would reflect the relative proportions of the food groups in that Eat Well guide. But at the more extreme end, when we're worried that a child is refusing a wide range of foods, we might instead set the bar a little bit lower and say, well, it might not be perfect, but is it good enough? So what, what questions would we ask to decide whether we need to be worried or not? First of all, if we look at the fruit and vegetable group, we, we could ask, are there at least two foods from that fruit or vegetable group that are accepted? Secondly, we could look at the non-dairy protein group and say, are there at least two foods from that non-dairy protein group that are accepted? It might just be chicken nuggets or baked beans or mince and chicken or something like that. And then our final question would be, are each of the four main food groups eaten on most days? And if the answer to one of those three questions is no, then there could be a significant risk that that child's going to be going to be missing something quite important. So although we've set the bar quite low there, um, you know, that's quite important in terms of either putting people's mind at rest or referring on for some specialist support or advice or thinking about um, dietary supplements. Another way of assessing the diet would be to look more widely. So it'd be to include thinking about the four everyday food groups, but it'd be to ask a wider set of questions. So if we think about the main sort of dietary goals or dietary targets, dietary guidelines, the main things we would look at would be whether somebody's eating regular meals, whether they're having a varied diet with all the four main everyday food groups included, whether they're drinking plenty of water or having plenty of fluid, um, what their intake of fruit or vegetables is like, whether they're including some high fiber whole grain foods like high fiber cereal and wholemeal bread, whether they include oily fish or not, and also what their intake of added sugar is like. And for each of these questions, we can, we can rank it in terms of whether somebody always does these things or, or not so often or, or potentially scores quite poorly. So just circling which of those three answers you think are most appropriate, quite a good way of getting a handle on, on um, how concerned you should be about a child's diet, but also um, what, what the particular priorities are as well. The most obvious way in which that we think about food affecting our, our body is the impact that it has on our growth. If we eat too few calories to meet our needs, then it could affect our growth in terms of being underweight or, or um, you know, uh, shorter than we might otherwise be. Um, or of course, if we eat a larger number of calories, it could mean that our weight is, is higher than we would otherwise expect it to be. But growth and weight um, don't really tell us very much other than about kind of calories in and calories out. It's quite misleading to kind of judge um, whether somebody's diet is adequate based on, on, on how they're growing or, or what their weight is. We can think of those long-term health risks, those conditions that we regard as at least partly diet-related disease, although there's lots of different factors at play. Things like the risk of heart disease, stroke, and certain types of cancer. 
can be affected by diet and by certain patterns of eating, by the excess or deficiency of certain nutrients. We can also think about bone health. So when we think about calcium rich dairy foods, um, do we have enough of those to ensure that when our skeleton is growing, it grows strong and dense and isn't likely to, to snap if we fall over? We can think about our gut health as well. So are we getting enough fiber in our diet to keep our gut nice and healthy um, and to prevent constipation? And we can also think about different aspects of brain function. So does our diet enable our brain to grow and develop in a healthy way? Does it maintain good brain health into um, middle and, and older age, um, as well as through childhood? So there are lots of different ways in which the brain and the body is affected by different aspects of diet. One of the most useful ways of thinking about this is to think about um, the importance of eating regular meals and think about how our blood sugar is affected by the timing of what we eat, by how much we eat or, or the nature of what we eat. So this uh, blood sugar roller coaster is quite a useful model for getting that across. So for example, if we ate something that was highly refined, was low in fiber and high in added sugar, we might expect our blood glucose to rise quite rapidly. Our body would produce insulin to get the blood sugar back under control, but the steeper the rise, the sharper the fall. Alternatively, we might have something like a bowl of porridge for breakfast. It would take longer to break down um, the starchy carbohydrate within the porridge because the fiber slows everything down. So the blood sugar would rise, it wouldn't rise so far, it would stay up for longer and it would fall more slowly. Thirdly, if we didn't eat breakfast at all, or we went for many hours without eating a meal, then our blood sugar would get, would get lower and lower. And so as we click through this slide, we can see that if we can get that blood sugar at a nice steady level, not too high and not too low, by eating regularly and eating foods that take time to break down into process, it's gonna help us feel calm and focused. But if we get these sharp dips in blood sugar, because we've eaten a diet that's very heavily processed or we've been too long without eating food, then these low points will affect our mood and our concentration. And that's largely because as our blood sugar falls, um, our body has to release a stress hormone called cortisol, which enables the liver to put more energy back into the system. But by this stage, our veins are full of stress hormone, a kind of fight or flight hormone. So it's not really gonna help with them um, with, with, with good mood. Okay, so that was our blood sugar roller coaster. And the message from that is about eating food that's minimally processed, that's relatively natural, still has a lot of the, the natural fiber included, but also about eating regular meals. On the other hand, the other way in which diet affects the brain is by the balance of micronutrients that we get um, from the diet. So this table shows you a number of different vitamins and minerals and fatty acids and, and what the best food source of those nutrients would be. In each case, these nutrients are ones that are, are quite often lacking in, in specific children's diets. And um, we've shown in the right-hand column the uh, parts of the body or the aspects of health that these nutrients are particularly important in. The main thing to focus on here is that some of these nutrients apply to specific foods rather than just a whole food group. So for example, um, iron would be found in very high levels in the non-dairy protein group, um, but it would specifically be in, in red meat, and you wouldn't find high levels of iron in chicken, for example. Similarly, um, uh, magnesium and folic acid are nutrients we find a lot in green vegetables. We don't find quite so much of them in fruit. So depending simply on the balance of food groups won't necessarily give you the full picture because there might still be specific micronutrients that you'd be short of. And some of those like vitamin D, uh, we don't depend largely on our diet for that. We get most of that from exposing our skin to sun during the summer months. Okay, I've got uh, three slides now that I'm borrowing courtesy of the Food and Behaviour Research Charity from um, Dr. Alex, Alex Richardson. And this first one um, shows a study by um, Bernard Gesh in a young offender centre in England some years ago, where they gave vitamins, minerals and fatty acids to some of the young offenders. And some of the other young offenders had an identical looking and tasting 
placebo supplement. And what they were able to demonstrate was that there was a, a 37% reduction in violent offending behaviour amongst the young offenders that, that took the supplement. So what can we what can we conclude from that? We can cl conclude that many of those young offenders for all sorts of complex social and psychological reasons have had long-term inadequate diets and that by making good the um, status of different vitamins, minerals and fatty acids in the brain, it was affecting mood and behaviour and, and, uh, and we can see that reflected in the results. Another example here is specifically with omega-3 fatty acids, which are the essential fats that we get from oily fish like mackerel, herring and sardines. And um, this is a, a, if you like, a meta-analysis. It's a study of studies using omega-3 um, to um, see if it can have an effect on reducing ADHD symptoms in people with an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder diagnosis. And what this study shows is that it is um, moderately effective in improving some of the symptoms of ADHD, particularly some of the inattentive bits of, um, of, of ADHD. It doesn't work as quickly as prescribable medication. It takes time to build up um, in the tissue. And so we tend to see the positive effects of, of omega-3 after a number of months rather than just, uh, just a week or two. And finally, in this, um, this study, is using omega-3 compared to placebo to see what impact it has on sleep, in, um, in this instance, in neurotypical children. And what it shows us is that um, the children who took the omega-3 on average um, slept uh, almost an hour per night more than those who didn't. That makes sense because when it gets dark, our brain produces melatonin to help us feel sleepy. But in order for your brain to produce melatonin, it needs the essential building blocks. And, and omega-3 is one of the building blocks that your brain needs to be able to do that. So no wonder then that when giving omega-3 to a number of children, uh, we see improvements in sleep. And here's another study from New Zealand um, looking at omega-3 and vitamin D on uh, young children with an autism diagnosis. And they were able to show that vitamin D reduced both hyperactivity and irritability and that omega-3 um, uh, also reduced irritability as well. So if we look at the brain, um, there are certain micronutrients that the brain in particular, the body too, but the brain in particular needs. And um, uh, each of these four nutrients, um, in this instance, two, two minerals, a fatty acid and a vitamin, um, have important and specific effect, effect, effects on brain health and brain function. Magnesium that we get largely from green vegetables helps us to feel calm. Iron helps with concentration, energy levels, irritability, reducing irritability. Um, vitamin D helps with a whole range of things, specifically bone health, but we're now seeing a wider range of benefits from vitamin D. And last but not least, omega-3 that we get from oily fish as being uh, particularly important for health and well-being in general, but the healthy brain in particular. So if we summarize the section on food and the brain, we could put it into two categories. We need regular meals based on whole foods to help regulate blood sugar. And we also need nutrient-rich foods to provide key micronutrients that the brain needs for optimum uh, functioning. Uh, finally, on this section, if we think briefly then about, about nutritional supplements, if we know that um, many children's diets aren't as, as adequately varied as they, as they ought to be, for many children, I think there's a strong case for supplementing with omega-3 fatty acids or with vitamin D. But for children who are particularly selective and who don't eat a wide range of foods, there's a strong case for giving a general age-appropriate multi-purpose and mineral supplement. And I show mineral in bold because many of the vitamin supplements marketed to parents of, of children um, are vitamins only, um, but it's quite likely that that child will need minerals um, as well as vitamins. You can find out about more, uh, more research in, in this particular area by visiting um, www.fabresearch.org. That's the, the research charity whose um, slides I was using earlier. So they have uh, up-to-date research on, um, on, on all sorts of aspects of of nutrition and the brain.
So we can think about learning about nutrition, but actually just learning about good food can come without necessarily learning too much about nutrition. And children who are involved in the whole process of growing, shopping, cooking and eating and making decisions about that will often will often um, develop a, a healthy relationship with food without needing to know a lot of technical and scientific information about the science of nutrition. But when children are being taught about nutrition, it's important to use positive language and to use non-judgmental language for foods. And that's something, that's a trap that, that many, many adults fall into in the way that they uh, refer to, to food and health. We need to think about the importance of regular eating and a varied diet. So I'll give you some examples of each of these in the next few slides. So these, these pupils from Bray Primary School in, in Caithness are um, arranging their fruit and vegetables as a rainbow. Um, and the point is with these young children, they don't need lots of abstract learning about nutrition. They're just taking the food on face value and enjoying it, enjoying it for what it is. As children get older, it's important for them to understand about different food groups and why it is that we need a varied diet. And here's some pupils, pupils from Hilton Primary School in Inverness um, doing exactly that. You can see them organising the descriptions of each food group against the, against um, you know, what, what each of those food groups do for us. These pupils, again from Hilton, are then taking the Eat Well plate and they're writing down foods that they've seen advertised through social media or on TV and they're placing it on the food group um, that they think um, that food that's being advertised belongs to. And uh, this particular one here, I think from, from McArdle Primary, you can see that the uh, foods high in fat and sugar, but low in nutritional value are highly overrepresented in food advertising and food marketing. When we look at the kinds of foods that we should be eating less often, um, it's important to think about that language. If we call these foods bad foods, or these foods are junk foods, or these foods are treats, well, if they're treats, we might want them more. If they're bad, maybe we want them more because they're the forbidden fruit, or maybe we feel guilty for eating them. So picking the right language to help children learn a healthy and relaxed relationship with food is quite important. We prefer the term sometimes foods rather than being bad foods or junk foods or making them more valuable by describing them as treats. So these are sometimes foods because they don't give us anything we need. It doesn't, we don't have to include them, but it's okay if we include them sometimes. We don't wanna make them more special than, than they need to be. And when we think about the Eat Well Guide then, um, the main four food groups on the Eat Well Guide, plus our little purple one of oils and spreads, these are the everyday foods. These are the foods that we, uh, our brain or our body has specific requirements for. So we need to eat them either every day or, or, or most days as opposed to sometimes foods. And again, just as in one of the previous sections, um, we can think about the starchy carbohydrates giving us energy. We can think about the calcium rich dairy foods for strong bones and teeth, the non-dairy protein foods to help us grow and the fruit and vegetables for a healthy heart. So these symbols are quite useful to use with children so that they understand why there are these different types of everyday foods and why they're important for our health and well-being. Um, there isn't a symbol required for the sometimes foods because we would be perfectly healthy if we didn't include any, but it's okay to eat some of them some of the time. We also looked in a previous section at the blood sugar roller coaster, and I include it in this section just to make the point that it's a very good teaching tool to help children learn about everything from the importance of eating breakfast to the importance of not skipping meals um, and the effect that that has on mood and concentration. And that's a much bigger payback for young people once they understand that what they've eaten in the previous hours actually affects them um, in the same day. That's much more useful than long-term um, motivation of whatever particular diet related diseases you may or may not die of in 50 years time. We can extend this discussion then about um, how blood sugar rises and falls by linking it to the effect of food processing. If we have foods that have been minimally processed and they still include the fiber, then the blood sugar will rise and fall more slowly and it will help 
with mood and, and concentration as well as gut health. So here we have some specific examples of foods in, the, in, their, in their relatively natural state. So we've got sugarcane, um, apples, wheat, sunflower seeds, potatoes, tomatoes, sweet corn and chicken. And as we process those foods, we turn them into something else. So we've got uh, sugar cubes, apple juice, uh, whole grain bread, sunflower oil, boiled potatoes without the skin, canned tomatoes. In this instance, we've got polenta, and then we've got um, chicken nuggets. And each time we process a food in this way, we take some things out and put some other things in. So we can go again. And now we've got a sugary soft drink, we've got sliced white bread, we've got French fries, we've got ketchup, we've got um, uh, corn chips, and, um, and then we've still got the chicken nuggets. So suddenly we've, we've gone through a, a, a number of transitions and we can think with these slides about what's been removed, what's been added, and which are easier to eat to excess. And also linking that back to marketing and advertising. Um, a lot of these highly processed foods are the ones that have a lot more money spent on, on promoting them. We also make the point here that some of these forms of food processing are perfectly sensible. So for example, it's not particularly sensible to eat wheat grains, you might break your teeth, you might struggle to digest them. But once you turn them into whole grain bread, that's a practical form of food processing. Similarly, we might take tomatoes, take the skin off, put them in a can, and it means we can have tomatoes in the middle of the winter. But we can have too much of a good thing, and if we turn that into white sliced bread and ketchup, then it, it, it doesn't look quite so well balanced if that's, um, if, if that's what, what the diet starts to look like. So again, these pictures are quite useful in getting people to understand why having too many processed foods might not be um, the most helpful, even though we might want to include some of them sometimes because of taste or convenience or, or, or for, for whatever reason. Again, extending the idea of thinking about sugar and fibre, these pupils at Hilton are ranking breakfast cereals in terms of their fibre and their sugar content. Again, thinking about how that links back to the blood sugar roller coaster and how that makes you feel um, at different points during the day. And these pupils from Drakey's Primary are just extending that activity a bit further and designing their own healthy breakfast cereal. We can also learn by analogy. So for example, um, two analogies that are quite useful to do with nutrition are to do with fueling and servicing a car or with growing vegetables. And I'll take you through these two examples. So if we're fueling our body for being physically active, then the analogy with a car and filling the tank up to go on a long journey is quite useful. We could think of our own sense of hunger as our fuel gauge and that we should respond naturally when we're hungry to um, recognizing that it's time for refueling. But we can extend the activity further. While we might fill our car up with petrol or diesel or, or electricity um, every week or every month, um, every few months we might want to check the air in the tires, the water in the radiator, or that there's oil in the engine, we might get the car serviced. And so we can think in the same way about the four everyday food groups. In some schools we'll get children to draw a picture of a child and we'll think about the bones, the heart, um, we'll think about muscles and we can think about energy. Um, and then next to it we might draw a picture of a car and think about putting fuel in the tank but also remembering every so often to check that there's air in the tyres, um, that there's uh, water in the radiator and that there's, um, there's, there's oil in the engine as well. So in, in that way it's useful for thinking about the short-term importance of making sure there's enough fuel in the tank as it were um, but also there are other aspects we need to pay attention to every so often and that's a, a very good way of promoting the four everyday food groups and the need for some dietary variety rather than everything coming from one food group. Similarly uh, many schools and many homes um, have um, vegetables growing or fruit or, or other plants in the garden and if we think about something like the humble leek and we think about what that needs to nourish it, then of course it needs the right conditions. It needs water, it needs sun, it needs air. Specifically, vegetables need carbon dioxide. We need oxygen, but we both need air. And of course it needs nutrients from the soil. And many of these nutrients that a plant gets from the soil, we get from our diet. 
so nutrients like magnesium and calcium are needed just as much by us as they are by vegetables. But while a plant may need about 17 different nutrients, we need give or take about 40 different nutrients to be provided by a diet. So again, the message there is that, you know, variety, variety is a good thing um, because that's our best way, most reliable way of getting all the nutrients we need. And this picture just brings that all together. So we can see here the similarities between um, growing and nurturing vegetables and uh, paying attention to our own health and well-being. We both need air, we need water, we need sun. And um, you can almost imagine the Eat Well Plate or the Eat Well Guide as a kind of visual map to what our own version of, of, of healthy soil looks like. So again, that's a useful way of introducing the Eat Well Guide or the Eat Well Plate so that children can understand why it is that eating a wide variety of foods is, is good for health and well-being. They can relate to the idea that if you didn't give a vegetable the right growing conditions, it might start to suffer and wilt and, and, and not grow very well. Uh, it, in that sense, it's important for us to not be too complacent about our own nutrition. Um, you can get more ideas about helping children learn about food and health by visiting our um, High Five website. That's specifically for primary school teachers, but there are lesson plans there that you can browse. So that's www.highfive.scot.nhs.uk. And first of all, we can think about the different influences there are on children's food preferences. So at the center of this, we have the psychology of the child. So I'm seeing many children with autism. They tend to uh, stick with what they know, be fearful of change. And many of those children and many other children as well might have quite strong sensory preferences for particular flavors or smells or textures. But outside of the individual, we have the parenting style, the family food culture, the amount of money available, and more widely in society we have for example, school or nursery food policy, whatever shops might be available locally, catering outlets, the influence of advertising and marketing, and of course the influence of, uh, of our peers. And it's really how all of those influences come together over time that will shape somebody's, um, somebody's preferred diet. If you want two examples, we showed this picture in a previous section, and this just demonstrates the disproportionate promotion uh, advertising and marketing of, of, of foods um, from the uh, from the sometimes food group. The foods that we don't need um, are, are the ones that are, are promoted most strongly um, by the food industry. And if we think about um, the amount of money available, this study from um, September 2018 by the Food Foundation looked at the affordability of the UK's Eat Well Guide and it did some a bit of number crunching and it concluded that a family uh, with two children aged 10 and 15 would each spend over 100 pounds a week and that means that 27 percent of households would have to spend over a quarter of their disposable income after housing costs just to meet the minimum requirements of the eat well guidance and they, the authors conclude that the coexistence of unhealthy diets and food insecurity is a logical consequence of the uk's food system where nutrient-rich foods are three times more expensive than unhealthy ones. So the amount of money available can have a big influence on, on the food choices that people make and the food culture that we see. If we think about health eating guidelines then, if we think about the old eat well plate as it was, and we take the pictures off and we just show the names of the groups, we can see we have our fruit and vegetable group, starchy foods, protein, calcium rich dairy, foods high in fat and sugar. So those are the four food groups in the proportions that the dietary guidelines recommend. But the average for young people in Highland, in some work that we did some years ago with primary school teachers, the average for primary five, primary six children um, looks more like this, where we see the high fat, high sugar food group um, massively expanded, largely at the expense of the fruit and vegetable group. This um, graph um, is, is taken from a study looking at the household availability of, of, of ultra processed foods and the relationship with obesity in 19 different European countries. And what we can see there is that as there's more ultra processed food available, the kind of food that's easy to eat in large amounts, we see increased rates of obesity. Um, and you can see the United Kingdom is a bit of an outlier on that graph. 
um, with uh, the, both the highest prevalence of obesity of uh, those countries studied and also the highest relative availability of ultra processed foods. And similarly, coming back to Highland, this data from NHS Highland looks at um, body mass index in primary one children against deprivation. And what it shows us is that the uh, risk of a primary one child being defined as, uh, as obese is almost twice as high amongst the most deprived, 20%, as it is amongst the least deprived. So again, we can see that, that uh, relationship between um, obesity and deprivation. And if we look at this study from the, um, from the OECD, um, looking at their health statistics, we can see that the United Kingdom has a relatively high rate of adult obesity. And we can look at the different countries and the different percentages there and start to speculate what is it that different countries are doing or not doing that might explain the different rates of obesity? Answers on the postcard. And similarly, here's a study looking at um, overweight and obesity amongst 15-year-olds. Uh, and we can see the two extremes there, Denmark with the lowest rate and the United States with the highest rate, a threefold difference in the overweight and obesity rate amongst teenagers. Um, also, what's interesting by comparing those two countries is the, is the level of inequality between the two countries as well it might be, might partly explain the high, the high differences. Um, just a note of caution in relation to weight as the measure of health, it's very measurable, but health and weight are not the same thing. There tends to be a preoccupation with what we can measure easily. It's, it suits people who are carrying out studies like the one I've just shown you. Um, but adequate calories is not the same as adequate nutrition. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that genes, life circumstance, there's a whole range of factors that affect our weight that aren't necessarily particularly within an individual's control. And that preoccupation with weight um, is not necessarily good for our physical or, or, or emotional well-being. So if you think about um, selective eating, why am I using that term? I prefer the term selective eating. It's a bit of jargon, but it's better than picky eating or fussy eating because it kind of gives a little bit more respect to, you know, why it is that somebody is, is choosing to select an hour range of food. Um, picky or fussy sounds like somebody's just being awkward and they just need to get on with it. And sometimes that underplays how important um, a, a diet is to, to, um, to a child. Um, who, who is a selective eater. And um, we might be thinking about uh, a poor frequency of eating, sort of gaps between meals. We might be thinking about not enough food reflected in poor growth. But most often we're thinking about a lack of variety or poor quality of food being selected. The majority of selective eaters eat enough calories. Their growth is, is fine. Um, a smaller number don't, and that's an additional concern. But generally, um, most selective eaters uh, look fine if you just uh, look at the growth charts. However, growth is no guarantee of nutritional adequacy when we think about everything that the brain and the body and the immune system needs to stay healthy. Causes of selective eating then. There are a number of different causes. One is, is sensory preferences. So there might be preference for different flavors or, 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 or particular smells of food. Um, or the look of certain foods, but one of the most common and most underestimated influences is the mouthfeel or texture of different foods. When you put it in your mouth, when you bite into it, when you try and chew and swallow it. So texture is a big, um, is a big um, issue when it comes to children with strong sensory preferences quite often. There might be category preferences. So how many parents have said, I don't understand why you'll eat um, chicken nuggets when you won't eat roast chicken. Well, that might be the same category. So a child who knows that they eat something that's called chicken and is in a chicken nugget and happily eats roast chicken, well, well that's fine because they're, 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 not, they're, they're accepting a change of categories. Um, but a, a child might actually prefer to refuse the roast chicken um, because they don't think that it has the same sensory characteristics. Similarly, a child might learn that certain foods that parents approve of, that are green or are called vegetables, they might have one negative experience with one of them and then decide they're never eating anything that's healthy or is called a vegetable or is colored green again. 
food neophobia, so there might be fear of, of, of the taste or the texture of foods that, that a child's never experienced before. And then parents will find themselves in a difficult position of saying things like, how do you know you don't like it until you've tried it? And a child could be holding out for something better. So a lot of food refusal isn't fear of the new food, it's a desire to uh, find a sure way of getting the food that you're most used to and that you enjoy the most. And finally, it's not always about the food. If a child, particularly a non-verbal child or a child with social communication difficulties and ha has had a really miserable or stressful day at nursery or school, what better way um, to communicate that to your parents when you come home than to refuse to eat your tea? And it's a parental balancing act. It's very difficult for parents to get this right, to ensure adequate growth, where we might prioritise giving a child what they know they will eat, to ensure sufficient variety, so we've got the balance of the everyday food groups and all the vitamins and minerals that are needed for health and well-being, but also to ensure that for the, for the adults and for the child, meal times are enjoyable and relaxed. Very often, um, a bit like juggling, um, if you're focusing on, on, on juggling two things, the other one gets dropped because um, it's just too much to concentrate on all three things at the same time. The most common errors in addressing selective eating, the first error would be parents worrying about a diet that might not be perfect, but is actually good enough. So going back to the section on, on working out whether a child's diet is good enough is quite useful for that, because in some cases, um, it's possible to get some reassurance for that and think, okay, the diet may not be perfect, but actually it's good enough. Um, the most common error is too much coaxing, too much persuasion and too much negotiation. Three more spoonfuls and you can have your ice cream. Um, go on, just have a little taste of it. Have a little taste of it and you can get this, that or the other. Um, or negotiating. So these are all well-intentioned, but the more selective and nervous a child is about eating foods they're not used to, the more counter, the more counterproductive these strategies are. Using rewards, rewards and incentives fits into that as well. It sometimes wins the battle, but loses the war. If I have to be incentivized or rewarded to eat this food, what does it say about that food? And there can be a danger in lots of the conversations and even rows and disagreements with a child about their eating habits that end up labeling a child as a fussy eater. It becomes a badge um, that, that they end up wearing and, and living up to. So these are all understandable pitfalls, but they're all, um, uh, they're all difficulties that arise when a parent is trying to address um, this difficult situation of, of a child who's become a very selective eater. So we'll move on now on to the most successful approach to tackling selective eating in young children. The first step is good modelling. Often good modelling doesn't mean enough, does, doesn't feel like you're doing enough. Good modelling is really just being seen to be eating the kinds of foods that you want a child to develop a taste for. Secondly, appearing not to care. It's incredibly important that a child who's very defensive around food um, doesn't think that the adults around them want them to eat particular foods um, and, and, and want to influence uh, what they're eating. Appearing not to care is an incredibly important step and something that many parents and carers of, find selective, of selective eaters find difficult to do. Thirdly, we need to expose a child to the right foods. That doesn't mean chasing them around the kitchen with a spoon full of vegetable soup. It just means the kind of food that a child sees most often. You can do the first three, but if we're not bold enough to do number four, then we might not make much progress. Number four, is minimizing exposure to the most preferred foods. Sometimes it is the few foods that the child is sometimes obsessing over that have to be out of sight and out of mind and not a possibility before a child is, is prepared to entertain the idea of something different. And number five is ensure the changes are realistic. Nutritionally, you might know that what a child really needs is a plate full of, of, of liver and Brussels sprouts, but in terms of the difference in concept, in appearance, in smell, in texture, in taste, it might be too much too soon. This next slide, slide is, a, is a planning tool. And it, the example here is a child who has a particular obsession with chicken nuggets, not any old nugget, but a, a chicken muck nugget from a well-known uh, burger chain. So we've drawn out the characteristic of that strongly preferred 
processed foods, the color, the taste, the smell, the texture, etc. And then we're trying to think, where do we go next? What food is similar but different? That's an example of what we mean by realistic changes and planning for those. In some ways, the fish finger is similar but different. In some ways, roast chicken breast, turkey dinosaur, hamburger, etc. So that's quite useful in helping a parent have empathy for how a child might see things, um, particularly if the child is paying particular attention to characteristics of a food that a parent is just overlooking and doesn't really see any importance in. Now we're moving on to quite an important slide. So this looks at a child who has a strong preference for the foods and drinks in the right hand column. In this instance, it's chicken nuggets, it's hot dogs, it's not just chips, but microchips that go into the microwave in a cardboard box, and it's diluting juice. So in this instance, if we were to provide um, an alternative food, for example, of fish fingers alongside chicken nuggets, we could reliably assume that the fish fingers will be ignored and the chicken nuggets will be eaten. On the other hand, if we provided the child with a choice of fish fingers or mince, if mince is the alternative, maybe somehow fish fingers look remarkably similar to the chicken nuggets and perfectly acceptable. So that's a really good demonstration of what I mean about um, ensuring that you sometimes, uh, making sure that sometimes you're brave enough to remove the most familiar food and to provide a choice of two other foods of, of different degrees of challenge. If nothing else, the most challenging option will make the intermediate option look relatively appealing and acceptable. This picture is important to demonstrate um, another important point when trying to influence a selective eater without putting too much pressure on. So in this particular instance, the food that is in the middle of the table doesn't belong to anybody. And similarly, in the way that many families might serve a meal, it can be quite useful for everybody to come to the table with an empty plate or bowl have serving dishes in the middle and allow everybody to help themselves to whichever item they prefer. This is particularly useful for parents who've fallen into the habit of just putting some peas or some vegetables on the, child, on the side of a child's plate in the hope that they might eat them one day and every day they end up putting them in the bin. Really it's a form of indirect nagging because the child knows perfectly well that even if the parent isn't saying anything, the reason they put them on their plate is because they would really like, to, like them to eat them. By putting those foods in a serving dish in the middle and leaving everybody to help themselves, if a child has helped themselves to that food, it's because they really wanted to. So a self-service format for meals, even just once a week, can lead to new breakthroughs, provided parents resist the temptation of prompting a child to choose food from a particular bowl, because um, that, that kind of undermines that sort of low pressure approach. I want to just touch as well on, on dessert and also on bedtime snacks. Two of the questions I often get asked are, should you withhold dessert if the main course hasn't been eaten? And should you give an extra bedtime snack if a child is hungry because they didn't eat their meal earlier? It's hard to answer these questions um, in, in, a, in a sort of black and white way, but I would say consistency would be the key to success. It's very common family practice to withhold dessert if the main course hasn't been eaten. But if you're saying to somebody, eat your sprouts and you, you can have your ice cream, what does that say about the sprouts and what does it say about the ice cream? It presents the idea of the main meal as a chore to be overcome and, and the, the, the reward food waiting for you later. It might be much better if you're in the habit of having a two course meal, just to allow somebody to have dessert after their meal, um, whether, whether they've eaten all of it or not in the long run. And similarly, in terms of an extra bedtime snack, you might be feeling concerned or guilty that a child hasn't eaten much of the meal. But if you feel the meal you gave them was realistic and achievable, then simply giving them an extra couple of slices of toast at bed might not be the best idea if it leads to that becoming a learned behaviour and a child realising that they may as well refuse their tea the next night um, because in the end they'll just get extra slices of toast or extra biscuits or an extra glass of milk. So if keep it consistent. If it's normal for a child to have dessert, if it's normal for a child to have a slice of toast or a glass of milk before bed on days when they've eaten well, then make it no more or no less on days when they haven't eaten their meal so well. Okay, a summary on that selective eating session then. Appear not to care, and that takes lots of practice for parents who do care. Um, try to model rather than persuade or negotiate or coax. 
be patient and persistent, focus on small realistic changes, and if you're still worried, do consider the use of a vitamin and mineral supplement. My last slide just gives you a couple of um, sources of further information. So if you have a severely selective eater and you want to hear more about other people who are experiencing similar things, you can visit www.mealtimehostage.com and also uh, locally within Highland, we have some pages on the Bumps to Bairns website, the food and health pages that cover um, everything from what to eat to how to eat to helping to develop a healthy body image in preschool children. Um, and there's even a section there on, on, on managing picky eating. And finally, that's my email address at the bottom. Um, so uh, feel free to contact me if you need me to um, expand on anything I've said in the, uh, in the previous slides. Thank you.